I didn't get through rereading, but what I did get through rereading, I don't know why it never occurred to me how much like Luke must have messed with Aries to um to get him to like mm -hmm. yeah, cuz I mean they say it, but since they don't show it, it kind of like doesn't stick out as much where they say that um, Ares must have been sent to look for the bolt, and then mm -hmm. while he was looking for the bolt, he found Luke, and Luke recruited him. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Ares is easy to manipulate, you know. We've talked about Grover doing it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but the way that he's just able to be like, hey, so do you want war? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I always, that's like one of those, like, what if moments because if Ares had done I guess the right thing um and like turned in Luke then nothing would have been stolen and everything would have stopped probably right there I don't know what they would have done with Luke like if the gods would have killed him they might have killed him <laughs> honestly um which might have started something else completely different but it wouldn't have been him um but either way it never would have happened without him. And Luke definitely knew what to say to him in that moment to be like, don't you want to fuck with your dad? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, because I'm sure that he was also prepped by, you know, Kronos and stuff about what to say in that moment as well. Um, from like the dreams that Percy has, he's obviously good at manipulating. Yeah, and I don't know if the implication is supposed to be that they did manipulate Ares through dreams because we have the whole Ares denying that gods have dreams and then Poseidon saying we do. Um, yeah, it it's a little bit more clear cut in the books where he definitely is, by Kronos at least. Um, like one change, I didn't read the book version because I knew that <laughs> reading the scene with Poseidon and, and Percy is way worse in the book and so i didn't want to read that because i knew that it would make me upset <laughs> but i remember that in the book version with aries that aries is going to kill them or at least kill percy and chronos literally like stops him and like they don't that's less like the moment in the book where percy says out loud that um that it's chronos doing all this stuff um but like so chronos literally has to like real like reel him in in that moment to stop him from just killing him. And so there is like more manipulation, at least from that end with Ares. That's kind of the whole thing with him is that like, there's many jokes in the book series that Percy makes about how Ares can't read. <laughs> and, and like, and things like that, because even Mars, like when he runs into Mars and he doesn't know who he is, he starts asking him if he can read or if he's an idiot and like things like that. Cause that, cause he hates, he doesn't know anything about himself, but he still hates anything to do with Aries. <laughs> um, so yeah. 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 Aries is, is like the easiest God, I think out of all of them to get to do what you want because you just got to make him angry <laughs> and that's it. You're done. <laughs> He's not going to second think it. I feel like they did a better job of covering that in the books because there's a little bit more back and forth between Ares and Percy where Ares is saying like, um, you were supposed to die in the underworld because then Hades would have the bolt and Hades would be looking for his helm still. And mm -hmm. I have the helm, but I'm going to frame it on your dad. And so that's going to get all of the three. Like it was very much more clear cut i'm trying to get all three of the brothers to war against each other where in the show i don't know it just seems like oh we're gonna war against poseidon and hades is just gearing up because percy already told him it's chronos mm -hmm. yeah and the book i don't know the the show version too is it aries to me in the show especially comes off as almost like a younger brother or something um that like wants to make everybody fight because he thinks it'll be fun to watch it all happen um and doesn't really care how it happens or who gets in the way of it necessarily he just wants to see it happen because he thinks it would be like a fun time um the sh the book is a little bit more calculated when it comes to him but i'm fine with him being a little bit stupider in the show <laughs> because i because i hate him so 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like it checks out for his character, who he is as a person because of the Trojan War stuff. So him mm -hmm. joining on the Trojan side just because of Aphrodite, even though he had already promised to fight with the Greeks to Hera and Athena. And, you know, like Zeus kind of, because he gets wounded in the Trojan War by this one dude, Diomedes, who like, mm -hmm. Athena bolsters a little bit and um, she removes the mist from his eyes and says, like, if you see Aphrodite on the battlefield, don't hesitate, go ahead. <laughs> That's the only God though. And so um, he does, he, he like stabs Aphrodite at one point and then Aphrodite goes and cries to Ares and Ares goes and joins the battle again. And um, at some point, this guy Diomedes is up against Ares and he's like, shirking back athena's like what the hell what are you doing and he says don't you remember you told me only aphrodite she's like oh oh well aries is fine <laughs> and um so he he throws his spear at him and it hits him in the stomach and um so like we do have aries getting wounded by a mortal because as far as i remember diomedes does not have any divine parentage maybe like divine grandparentage but not like as immediate as a demigod and um, yeah, Ares is just so engrossed in battle sometimes that he, he can be out strategized pretty easily. Yeah, that's part of the fun of Percy beating him, like a 12 year old kid beating the God of War, but it's purely because he was so wrapped up in the fact like, I'm way stronger than this kid. I have way more everything this is going to be so easy that it didn't occur to him that fighting him on a beach is the stupidest thing alive, literally, like the stupidest thing he could possibly ever do. He was so confident that he could beat a kid, Poseidon's kid, on the beach right next to the ocean that it didn't even occur to him that Percy would outsmart him and just let him like fling him around until he got close enough to the water that the water would take him out it like never even entered his mind because he's so overly cocky about all that stuff which like in my mind fits with somebody that's like wrapped up in winning all the time that they just like miss easy things like that because they're so sure that they're better than everyone yeah well and there was a little bit more out strategizing in the books when like it's written out that way i'm sure if we watch it it plays out the way that it's written in the books and i know they cut to like a scene of luke um teaching him how to fight instead but in the books percy says that he hears like luke telling him getting closer in his head because luke had trained him if the other person has a longer sword he's getting closer which strategy wise like longer sword you need a longer kind of um swing to get anybody to get the power and being in close like he he can't maneuver the sword the way he needs to and percy's smaller than him so percy can like do these maneuvers where he's faking him out and like going a different way mm -hmm. <laughs> that was one of the things that people critiqued about the show is that the aries fight wasn't long enough and i was like i think i'm okay with the amount of time I watched a, a 12 year old get almost beaten up by a god. <laughs> there's like, there's only so long that I want to watch like an actual kid get beaten up like that uh, before it gets to be a little bit too gratuitous. <laughs> so I was fine with it. And the fun thing, that's one of those things that I feel like people feel differently about now, now that they've watched the entire finale or when they did watch the entire finale because the Ares fight is like the fake out fight. The big fight is the Luke fight. Like that's the big daddy fight. <laughs> that's like this, like if you don't get that, if you don't get that scene right, all other seasons of the show doesn't work out right. And so that's like the big fight that actually matters. And so for people who had never seen or read the books, that was when they're like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> the Ares fight wasn't the big one. Never mind. I'm done. I'm done complaining about that now. <laughs> I mean, I can see why you think it. But yeah, it's, it's such a quick fight, because it just goes to show Ares is easily manipulated, easily outmaneuvered, because all he wants is battle. Mm -hmm. That's all he cares about. It's like you didn't even think about the fact that the thing that I like 
about Aries and Luke in this episode that they kind of connected even if they didn't necessarily mean to is that both of them were outsmarted by a bunch of 12 year olds by Percy and Annabeth and Grover but especially Percy and Annabeth like they both didn't think that they were smart enough to figure out what they were doing like I don't think Aries thought that they would figure out that what he was doing with them until it was even when it was obvious I don't think he thought that they would realize that he planted that stuff on them and that he was involved he probably thought that he could just show up in that moment and kick their ass and be done with it all <laughs> and the same thing happens later on with Luke where it, never once does it enter Luke's mind <laughs> that Percy and Annabeth are lying to him and that they've and that they know about you nope doesn't like you can tell from when he's like why aren't you talking to me and it's like oh I wonder <laughs> like, you fucking asshole <laughs> uh what was I gonna say oh before I forget like some cute like behind the scenes stories from this episode is this episode is very very good and it, it does such a good job of kind of wrapping up everybody's storylines in a very like satisfying way and um and so I love the behind the scenes stories of when they filmed the scene when Annabeth gives Percy the her necklace as like good luck before he goes to Olympus that's a little different from the books she gave it to him before the Aries fight in the books but it's the same idea like saying like I believe that you're going to make this come back and if you don't I'm never going to get this necklace back that has my dad's ring on it um when they were filming that scene Aryan who plays Grover just started crying <laughs> when he was watching the two of them film when she like puts it on him and it's one of those like natural things that I remember from my like high school stage crew moments that when you're watching people that just have really good chemistry you just like end up crying <laughs> and you're like oh my god what am I doing and he said it just like naturally like came out like watching them and then the other scene like that is the fight that um Charlie who plays Luke recently in an interview said that they weren't supposed to cry or like it wasn't in like the it wasn't in like the script for them to get teary eyed and they both do at certain points in the scene just because they were so like into the scene and their characters that it just like naturally came out and I'm like that's exactly how a finale of a show like this is supposed to be so it's it's really cool to he hear stories like that knowing that they like they got it out of them yeah yeah and um with the luke and percy scene i find it to be one of the most realistic fights because once per, um percy gets slashed in the arm and that's when he's down and that's when annabeth shows herself and most of the time in sword fights in media you see people keep going after they get slashed and stuff probably not realistic you'd probably be in so much pain you can't really lift your sword up yeah so, yeah there's a million there's literally a million things to say about that fight scene but like i could do like an entire one of these just on that fight scene because it's such a huge like moment for all of those characters in the book and the show but just to say a little bit about it is like that moment makes sense because it's such a huge it's such a huge moment like since in the book there wasn't like that like the the book version he goes out there with him and i remember that he kind of tries to recruit him for a little bit but i don't think he really expects percy to join him by then and percy in the book doesn't understand what's going on like in the book there's like two they get back from their quest and then it's like two months later and luke is bringing him out there um and so they've been at camp all this time with him and they didn't figure it out the in the book version and so when he goes out there with him he's just thinking that he's hanging out with luke and then luke suddenly is like this scorpion is going to kill you in one minute like bye now <laughs> and tells him that he's the one that stole the lightning bolt and that's it there's no like fight there's no argument there's no like conversation like there is in the show and so because that happens in the show, when Percy gets hurt, when he's apologizing to Luke, that's a really big deal because by that point in the fight, like, 
but that whole fight, like Percy's fighting him, but he's not really fighting him, if you know what I mean. Like he's fighting him because per because Luke starts fighting him when he mentions his dad. Um, but he's not actually trying to hurt him. He's trying to get him to stay. Like he's trying to stop him from leaving. And that's like his, uh, there's a video that Charlie posted of them like film, like practicing the scene. And you can see their fight choreography more. And I really like that because you can see in that the choreography for Percy right before he hurts Luke, he's just like desperate. He's like just desperately like slashing at him anywhere he can, which is why he accidentally does hurt him because he's just so desperate to try to get him not to leave so that they can stop whatever's going on with him before it gets worse. And then but then like when Luke hits him, it's like, never mind. <laughs> it's like that, it's that scary moment of realizing like Percy this whole time has been looking at Luke uh, as sometimes people in the fandom kind of look at Luke as like, he's just lost. He's been manipulated by Kronos. This is, isn't, isn't really him, but I can get him back. I can talk to him. I can explain to him what's going on. I can tell him about the dreams I've been having and the dreams the gods have been having. And he'll like, he'll drop what he's doing and he'll understand what's going on. And, and I can stop this before it goes too far. But then when Luke like hurts him, when he's in the middle of apologizing to him, um, especially considering that Luke is 19 and Percy's 12 and he and Luke is the one that taught him how to fight and Luke is known as like the best sword fighter at camp in like decades like he he's in that fight he's literally just like playing with Percy um like he grabs his arm when he's about to hit him because he knows what he's gonna do like he's just playing with him and so for him to hit him like that um that's really scary because it's like shit like <laughs> he's way more gone than I originally thought. And it's like, thank God that uh, Annabeth and I planned this so that he didn't kill me yeah. <laughs> because he would have like, that's one of the craziest things about that fight is that Annabeth throws her dagger at him when he has his, when he has fucking backbiter up ready to like stab Percy. And it's like, if she wasn't there, he would have done it. <laughs> and that's, that's like, really scary like I love how good Walker shows how scared he is when he's down there because it's realizing like you're not who I thought you were at all and that's that's really hard to show that on your face when you've just been filming like a fight scene um, but they do a really good job of showing kind of that process he goes through of damn like who is this guy <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember in the books if Annabeth sees the betrayal or sees any of the Luke ending. No, no. in the in the books, um, Percy tries to get back. He's like the poison in the scorpion is going to kill him in like a, like literally like a minute or two or something. And he basically finds his way back to he's trying to get to camp before he dies. And Annabeth is the one that ends up finding him like basically like falling over trying not to die and so you can assume that she is the one that helped him you know get medicine and saved his life and and all that but he has to tell her and tell everyone else what happened um and actually a friend of mine that i talked to about percy jackson stuff pointed out how they we liked how they changed that scene in the show too because um because annabeth sees it and we're wondering if that will change some of the dynamic with the people at camp when it comes to luke because annabeth is someone who's been at camp for years and who knew luke really well and so part of the weird dynamic especially in the second book but really for a bunch of the books going forward is that like people keep comparing percy to luke um and they keep they like have a hard time believing that Luke is actually as evil as he actually is. And they scapegoat Percy a lot with that stuff. Like they get mad at him because he is standing there being like, Luke tries to kill me many times and I'm just here. Hi. And they don't like that because they don't want to believe that he is. And because Percy's like the new kid or whatever, and he's the most powerful one there, they don't want to believe him. But 
it's a totally different dynamic when Annabeth, who's been there for years and is one of Luke's closest friends, saw him do it. Like, nobody can question that. <laughs> no one's going to ever, like, even think about questioning Annabeth when it comes in general, <laughs> but especially something like that. And so it makes me wonder if the show is going to be a little bit nicer to Percy like that. Like, maybe because it is like horrible that, especially in Sea of Monsters, the next season, people compare everything with him to Luke. They're like, oh, Luke was the best fighter before you. He was the, but you're really good at sword fighting. Luke was better than you though. Or Luke was the one that was the best before you were here. And Luke fought like this and you fought, fight everything with him. They like compare it to him. And it's like, can you shut up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with Charlie's like reaction then when, um, well, Luke's reaction, when he sees that Annabeth is watching this whole thing go down. I also think that changes the dynamic between them a little bit because I, I don't know what we're supposed to be getting. If that look on his face is supposed to be like, oh shit, am I the monster? Or, um, you know, is it more just, I didn't mean for her to see this yet? Yeah, um, I think it's the, I think it's the second one just because of how Luke is that and how people like Luke tend to be is Luke has like convinced himself that he is in the right. Like the psychological warfare in that scene is like out of this world that he's, it's honestly completely insane that he tells Percy, I'm still your friend, Percy. I'm sorry that Grover almost got sucked into hell. Like he, that line where he says like, I'm sorry, I didn't think that you would give the shoes to Grover is my mind boggling that he just admitted to this kid's face that yes those shoes i gave you was meant to pull you into hell and i'm apologizing to you because i accidentally sent your friend down there but i'm not apologizing to you for doing that yeah. like it's insane that he's sitting there telling percy i'm still your friend though and you should join me and i'm still a cool dude i'm still like fine i'm not i'm like and it, Percy's just sitting there like, what are you talking about? You just told me that you tried to kill me. And I figured that out beforehand anyway, but you just told me to my face yeah. that you tried to do that and you still think that you're in the right? Like that, to me, the face of him crying or whatever is because Luke is so, has just the idea that he has to be right about everything and that they've like campus just brainwashed them into not wanting to join him and stuff. That's very much kind of the tone he has when he's talking to Percy. Like he doesn't take anything Percy is saying seriously. Like Percy's sitting there like almost crying and he's just like, yeah, whatever. Like I'm leaving. Look at my cool sword that can kill humans. <laughs> that's They don't say that in the show, but that's one of those details in the book that he made a sword that has iron on it or metal that can kill regular humans along with like magical things. And it's like, why did you make a, Why did you make a sword that can kill innocent people? Like, and what, what, where are you going where you need to like stab innocent humans that have nothing to do with anything? Just yeah. a question that I'm having in my mind right now. Like, I remember that was one of the first times when I read the book that I was like, why does he have that? Yeah. <laughs> um, can, celestial um, can celestial bronze pierce the demigods? Yes. Celestial okay. bronze hurts demigods and like gods and like monsters. Yeah, but if there's, if there's if there's like if there's like regular people like not demigods around and they like slash the swords or whatever they are at them, it just goes through them. It can't hurt them at all. And most and some of like the interesting stuff in like the later books when they introduce Paul who like can't see through the mist is that he will like sit there and be trying to figure out what is actually going on because to him it looks like they're fighting with like fake swords <laughs> and stuff because of the mist but he knows that it's not actually fake but he can't actually see what they're doing it's that whole thing um but yeah so it's like what do you what do you need this for where you would need to kill people that aren't involved in anything that you're doing they're just they're like the it's interesting because when you get to like the end book part of like the pressure that they all feel is that they are trying to stop Luke and Kronos and stuff before it starts affecting the human world. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it starts hardcore affecting it during like the battle and stuff but they're tr that's part of like the pressure they feel is that it's starting to the regular humans are being affected by what they're doing because storms and hurricanes and crazy things are starting to it, it even happens in in this episode that like part of the pressure that percy feels to go to um, Olympus and stop everything is because Zeus is like causing storms and his dad is causing earthquakes all over the place. And it's like, this is now affecting people that aren't involved in our bullshit. <laughs> and so we need to find a way to stop this before they get hurt. While Luke is like, I have a, I have a sword to kill those people because they're below me. Um, but what was I saying about Annabeth? Yeah, that I think he was just, I think he, is sad because I think in his deluded little mind, he um, thought that if he had time to talk to Annabeth, that she would agree with him and like be on his side. Like he thinks the same thing about Thalia in the third book. Like I, um, there's a really horrible fight at the end of Sea of Monsters and it's, that fight is insane to think about. I like did not realize how horrible it is. Like he literally stands over Percy laughing when he can't, when he's hurt and he can't walk and wants and tells him that he wants the last thing that he ever sees is a monster eating Annabeth and Grover. Oh God. And like he gets saved at like the last second, like the last second something like comes in to stop that from happening. But the only reason why Luke doesn't stab him and kill him in that moment is because he wants him to watch his best friends die first. And like he's like that in that at the in that last fight because Thalia is coming back and he and he's so sure that Thalia will join him that he doesn't he doesn't think he needs Percy anymore. And like that book, like he that third book, he literally tell he like sits there and talks to Thalia expecting her to join him and is surprised that she doesn't like she pushes him off of a cliff. And the reason why she is able to do that is because she he's so surprised that she won't join him. And so I'm very sure that even show Luke was expecting that if I can just talk to Annabeth, she'll believe me. And that's the very like manipulative people like, like him, they think that they can talk themselves out of anything. And it never occurs to them that that the scene before they go out there is one of my favorite ones because he doesn't pick up any of like the weirdness of that scene that Annabeth is like, way more happy than normal sounding she's like i'm trying to keep the peace so percy doesn't just jump on his back or something <laughs> and and they're just and percy's freaked out and doesn't know what what to, he's like i don't he's like i don't even know where to put my face because i don't like what am i what are we what are we doing and it's just insane to it's really cool to listen to them say to his face like we can't accuse clarice because camp would get really upset so we need proof and he's like, yeah, that's fine, blah, blah, blah. We'll meet out in the woods at night by ourselves during a, during like the fireworks when everyone else is like occupied. And it never enters his mind until they're walking out there and Percy is like totally closed off to him that they're talking about him. Like it, it just, he's so like wrapped up in all of his plans, I think, that it never occurs to him that they've figured out what's going on and that they're trying to get evidence on him. <laughs> Because yeah. they can't just, they can't just accuse everybody's like best friend at camp of being a spy and trying to kill everybody without something besides, I guess, the, the whole shoes story. Yeah. <laughs> and he's the most powerful one there. They don't want to believe him, but it's a totally different dynamic when Annabeth, who's been there for years and is one of Luke's closest friends, saw him do it like nobody can question that <laughs> no one's gonna ever like even think about questioning annabeth when it comes in general <laughs> but especially something like that and so it makes me wonder if the show is going to be a little bit nicer to percy like that like maybe because it is like horrible that especially in sea of monsters the next season people compare everything with him to luke they're like oh luke was the best fighter before you he was the, but you're really good at sword fighting. Luke was better than you though. Or Luke was the one that was the best before you were here. And Luke fought like this and you fought, fight everything with him. They like compare it to him. And it's like, can you shut up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with 
Charlie's like reaction then when, um, well, Luke's reaction when he sees that Annabeth is watching this whole thing go down. I also think that changes the dynamic between them a little bit because I, I don't know what we're supposed to be getting. If that look on his face is supposed to be like, oh shit, am I the monster? Or, um, you know, is it more just, I didn't mean for her to see this yet. Yeah. Um, I think it's the, I think it's the second one just because of how Luke is that and how people like Luke tend to be is Luke has like convinced himself that he is in the right. Like the psychological warfare in that scene is like out of this world that he's, it's honestly completely insane that he tells Percy, I'm still your friend, Percy. I'm sorry that Grover almost got sucked into hell like he that line where he says like i'm sorry i didn't think that you would give the shoes to grover is mind-boggling that he just admitted to this kid's face that yes those shoes i gave you was meant to pull you into hell and i'm apologizing to you because i accidentally sent your friend down there but i'm not apologizing to you for doing that yeah. like it's insane that he's sitting there telling percy i'm still your friend though and you should join me and I'm still a cool dude. I'm still like fine. I'm not, I'm like, and it, Percy's just sitting there like, what are you talking about? You just told me that you tried to kill me. And I figured that out beforehand anyway, but you just told me to my face yeah. that you tried to do that. And you still think that you're in the right? Like that to me, the face of him crying or whatever is because Luke is so has just the idea that he has to be right about everything and that they've like campus just brainwashed them into not wanting to join him and stuff that's very much kind of the tone he has when he's talking to percy like he doesn't take anything percy is saying seriously like percy's sitting there like almost crying and he's just like yeah whatever like i'm leaving look at my cool sword that can kill humans <laughs> That's, they don't say that in the show, but that's one of those details in the book that he made a sword that has iron on it or metal that can kill regular humans along with like magical things. And it's like, why did you make a, Why did you make a sword that can kill innocent people? Like, and what, what, where are you going where you need to like stab innocent humans that have nothing to do with anything? Just a question that I'm having in my mind right now. Like, I remember that was one of the first times when I read the book that I was like, why does he have that? Yeah. <laughs> um, can, celestial um, bra can celestial bronze pierce the demigods? Yes. Celestial <laughs> bronze hurts demigods and like gods and like monsters yeah, so but if a, there's a, if there's monster. like if there's like regular people like not demigods around and they like slash the swords or whatever they are at them it just goes through them it can't hurt them at all and most and some of like the interesting stuff in like the later books when they introduce paul who like can't see through the mist is that he will like sit there and be trying to figure out what is actually going on because to him it looks like they're fighting with like fake swords and stuff because of the mist but he knows that it's not actually fake but he can't actually see what they're doing it's that whole thing um but yeah so it's like what do you what do you need this for where you would need to kill people that aren't involved in anything that you're doing they're just they're like the it's interesting because when you get to like the end book part of like the pressure that they all feel is that they are trying to stop luke and chronos and stuff before it starts affecting the human world um and it starts hardcore affecting it during like the battle and stuff but they're tr that's part of like the pressure they feel is that it's starting to the regular humans are being affected by what they're doing because storms and hurricanes and crazy things are starting to it, it even happens in in this episode that like part of the pressure that percy feels to go to um, Olympus and stop everything is because Zeus is like causing storms and his dad is causing earthquakes all over the place. And it's like, this is now affecting people that aren't involved in our bullshit. <laughs> and so we need to find a way to stop this before they get hurt. While Luke is like, I have a, I have a sword to kill those people because they're below me. Um, but what was I saying about Annabeth? Yeah, that I think he was just, I think he, is sad because I think in his deluded little mind, he um, 
thought that if he had time to talk to Annabeth, that she would agree with him and like be on his side. Like he thinks the same thing about Thalia in the third book. Like I, um, there's a really horrible fight at the end of Sea of Monsters and it's, that fight is insane to think about. I like did not realize how horrible it is. Like he literally stands over Percy laughing when he can't, when he's hurt and he can't walk and wants and tells him that he wants the last thing that he ever sees is a monster eating Annabeth and Grover. Oh God. And like he gets saved at like the last second, like the last second something like comes in to stop that from happening. But the only reason why Luke doesn't stab him and kill him in that moment is because he wants him to watch his best friends die first. And like he's like that in that at the in that last fight because Thalia is coming back and he and he's so sure that Thalia will join him that he doesn't he doesn't think he needs Percy anymore. And like that book, like he that third book, he literally tell he like sits there and talks to Thalia, expecting her to join him, and is surprised that she doesn't. Like she pushes him off of a cliff, and the reason why she is able to do that is because she he's so surprised that she won't join him. And so I'm very sure that even show Luke was expecting that if I can just talk to Annabeth, she'll believe me. And that's the very like manipulative people like, like him. They think that they can talk themselves out of anything. And it never occurs to them that, that the scene before they go out there is one of my favorite ones because he doesn't pick up any of like the weirdness of that scene that Annabeth is like, way more happy than normal sounding she's like i'm trying to keep the peace so percy doesn't just jump on his back or something <laughs> and and they're just and percy's freaked out and doesn't know what what to, he's like i don't he's like i don't even know where to put my face because i don't like what am i what are we what are we doing and it's just insane to it's really cool to listen to them say t to his face like we can't accuse clarice because camp would get really upset so we need proof and he's like, yeah, that's fine, blah, blah, blah. We'll meet out in the woods at night by ourselves during a, during like the fireworks when everyone else is like occupied. And it never enters his mind until they're walking out there and Percy is like totally closed off to him that they're talking about him. Like it, it just, he's so like wrapped up in all of his plans, I think, that it never occurs to him that they've figured out what's going on and that they're trying to get evidence on him. <laughs> Because yeah. they just can't just, they can't just accuse everybody's like best friend at camp of being a spy and trying to kill everybody without something besides, I guess, their, the whole shoes story. Yeah. <laughs> with that whole scene with like, I just lost my train of thought. With Luke um, very much manipulating them and you know blaming Clarice and oh we got to find evidence mm -hmm. like it's kind of funny that um the red herring of Clarice also kind of gets to or it didn't occur to Aries that he could have used Clarice that way in the first place mm -hmm. it's it's brought up in the books in the exchange that Percy and Aries have while they're fighting where he's like, oh, so you got Clarice to steal, steal the helm and the Master Bolt. And Ares is kind of like looking at him like, oh, shit, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Ares, ugh, because Ares is so horrible to his kids that he wouldn't, he has so much contempt for them as like just existing yeah. that he wouldn't think that they could handle something like that. Yeah, or he, he wouldn't think to use them in that way even to begin with. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing that he says to Aries, where you kind of get the um, you get the hint that he didn't really think things through when he joined the war, was like, you know, you could have kept the Master Bolt for yourself, and he's just like, oh yeah, I could have. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's right, I could have done that, but I don't think. Yeah. Um, like that one Poseidon's little comment about like. Aries is an idiot or whatever he says and Percy's like yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah, I'm glad we agree on this one thing. Um what was I going to say? Oh about the Luke stuff. Um one thing with that that I think is kind of interesting is I'm like relieved by this 
but a lot of people, even um, people I think involved in the show, sometimes have a hard time like figuring out why almost like the whole really weird shit that they do with Luke and Annabeth um, in later books. Uh, like in the last book, like Luke, Luke asks her if she loves him. And it's very obvious that he means like romantically. And by this point he is 23 and she is 16. And one of the things in the books with Annabeth that people kind of go back and forth about to try to figure out why Annabeth like won't let go of the idea that Luke could be saved, even though there's like 7 million things that happen in front of her that would make her maybe you would think that it would make her like second guess that. And so sometimes people think including like that interview with Walker Scobell this this past week that he did or that came out he was talking about it and he's really smart with like the books like I think it's fun to listen to him talk about Percy outside of the fact that he is Percy just because he's smart about the characters in the book and he's even con he sounds confused in that in that interview like I think it's because she I think that Percy's jealous of her because she has like feelings like that for Luke and she never got, and he's like, I think that, I think that Luke is, I, he's like, I guess Luke is the one that like never got over that when I thought, when I thought that it was Annabeth. And I was, and like one point I do want to make about all that is that I'm glad that nobody can understand that because it means that they don't understand people that are as horrible and manipulative and like completely lacking empathy the way that Luke does. But I just feel like it's important to state or like explain that people like Luke don't have the same motivations as everybody else does. And so I don't think that he said that to Annabeth because he actually had purely romantic feelings for her or anything like that. Um, I don't even think that her holding on to him was in like a way like he like she had a crush on him. I think it was more she like in her mind, she saved him from her dad and and Athena and stuff. And so I'm sure that I can understand and have lived that myself of like how it's hard to let go of someone that you think helped you in like a really hard time of your life. You don't want to think that they're actually not that good of a person too and and lose like somebody else. Um, but at least when it comes to Luke, it doesn't make him less of a predator. <laughs> like he definitely is. He definitely not only grooms Annabeth, he grooms other people in like full on like grooming. Like they don't label it as grooming, but it's grooming. Like there's pe the person, there's a whole storyline of someone who's a, a mole for him mm -hmm. and why he keeps, they keep thinking that they're surprising him. And then he ends up knowing that they're coming and they, almost die and it's because he is using the fact that somebody at camp has a crush on him and he tells them that oh if you give me information less kids will die even though that's not at all true but like she doesn't realize but you that's such a hard like place to be in and he manipulates that person constantly into doing that um by using like the fact that they have a crush on him and look up to him and want him to be a better person than he is and um so there is he does do that but I don't think he says that stuff or does those things in those scenes because he actually just is like, I want to date Annabeth <laughs> because that's one of those weird, like, I don't know what the right word for it. Um, the way that people talk about people who groom kids in like real life, they kind of show it a lot of times as if it's like a romantic thing. It's not a romantic thing. It's a, it's purely a power move. They want total control and total power. They want somebody who will not tell them no. And if you go to a kid that doesn't know things because they haven't been alive long enough to know it, and you also hide a lot of things about yourself from them until they've, they're they in too far with, to realize what's really going on, they're, you're more likely to get them to say yes to you when they normally would say no. That's why people who are predatory go towards younger people, not necessarily because they look at little kids and they're like, I'm romantically attracted to a 12 year old, but more because they can get what they want without having to actually try. <laughs> and I'm glad that like most of the kids in this fandom and also in the cast don't know that yet, <laughs> but I know that. And so I figure I can at least try to explain that. And cause I think that it helps 
you understand where Annabeth and also where Luke is coming from in the later seasons. Because one thing I wanted to say too is that Leah, when she was filming, she was there like watching them do the whole fight because she, you know, obviously she was there at the end of it. Yeah. And it, she said that watching them do that fight, she got so mad at Luke just like watching it and was like, how she went, like, I watched this interview with her where she went on like a 35 second rant and was like, how dare you do that to Percy? How dare you hurt him like that? How dare you hurt me? How dare you do this to the rest of camp? And she was literally getting so angry, like thinking about it as her character of like, stay away from Percy, get away from us and leave us alone. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> if the actress is feeling this, I can't, I like feel like it might be a little bit easier when it comes to that stuff with Annabeth like going forward in other books um there's kind of a built-in way to like fuck with her head in like the later books when it comes to luke um something happens with him in the fourth book that can definitely mess with her and make her like rethink what she's thinking but maybe it won't be quite so bad which would be nice because it was really bad in the books like she literally tells percy like are you happy that luke is evil and he's like no <laughs> but she says stuff like that to him often because she's you know it's a she's upset and one and he's there to take it out on because she he's making her think about it <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean i think it does make sense for annabeth to have a little bit of a crush on him just as like here's this older guy who's always taking care of me and save me but I feel like the way that it's at least played off in the show is more like that's a distant thing. Like if she ever felt that way, it was when she was littler. And now that she has grown, her feelings are more nuanced of this is my found family. Um, but I don't know what that means. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not. It's not like a present thing as much in the show. It's like we have this backstory. Percy is more jealous of anything of the fact that they have an established like relationship like that because he doesn't have a relationship like that with anyone but his mom that's and Grover, but, like but only yeah. for a year and i i get it i have i have feelings like that all the time because i don't have any friends <laughs> you're my friend <laughs> but pretty much that's it like i don't have like other people anymore and because all those people are now out of my life it's a good thing like it's a good thing they're not in my life anymore they weren't like the right people for me but it still is hard like seeing people be like oh i've known that person since i was a kid oh i've known that person even when i was growing up to have friends for longer than a few years was not something that i could do until i was like in high school <laughs> and so i definitely understand that feeling of being jealous that like these people have people in their lives like that and i wish that i could have that too um one so one thing i wanted to talk about that's very that's different uh, is the um poseidon stuff yeah. in in olympus in the book i don't remember absolutely everything in the book anymore but i remember enough and i'm hoping that this show like magically invents like poseidon scenes <laughs> yeah because um, after this scene, if you're going by the books anyway, he doesn't show up again until the very end of the fourth book at Percy's 15th birthday party. Um, that's the next time he talks to him in the books anyway. And so I'm hoping that just because I like the, I really like the actor, um, who is McGonagall's, uh, son. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Toby Stevens is, uh, I can't remember her name right now, um, but that's that's his mom. <laughs> um, but I really like him. He plays, he makes everybody want to like Poseidon way more than we normally would have <laughs> from how he is in the books. We're like, damn it, like you're so good at this role that you're making us want to like him and you're really messing with my daddy issues right now. But um, the book version of that scene, the reason why I didn't even read like the end of the book is the stuff we were talking about last week about Percy feeling like just seeing feeling like he's like the reason why everyone around him is struggling with one thing or another or feeling like people just tell him to his face that he shouldn't be alive. So there is that like he's not completely making it up. Um, but 
the scene in the book version with Poseidon, Poseidon apologizes to him for his life. Yeah. Like literally says like, I'm sorry. And he's like, okay. And he literally says like, I'm sorry that I like basically let you be born. Um, your life is going to be really hard. It's going to suck a lot basically is what he says. And it's like, okay, that's literally the worst, like on the level of things that you could say to your child the first time they ever meet you, that's probably the worst thing besides just like punching him in the face or something. Besides that, that's pretty much the worst, especially when your kid is Percy, <laughs> that's pretty much the worst thing to ever say in the world is, is to apologize to him for being alive and to tell him that it's a mistake that he's here and that, um, his life is going to be really hard and it's like okay <laughs> so at least he doesn't say that in the show he says like some nice they have like some nice like little conversations um it still ends with him feeling i think the same kind of betrayal because you literally see it on walker's face that he feels and he should feel betrayed that he asked his he just asked him do you think about my mom which is such a 12 year old kid thing to say about your parents. And, um, and he just like sends him away. I mean, I think part of Disney's approach with that was like that little pause was supposed to be like, I do, but I'm not going to tell you yeah. that. Too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how I feel about that because I mean, I don't, I don't think he has a torch over her in the books from memory. Does he? He definitely likes Sally a lot. Like Sally and Percy are like his favorites. Um, like the scene in the fourth book when he shows up at, like Poseidon, the god of water, shows up at his 15 year old son's birthday party. Like what? <laughs> like they, they don't do that at all. They don't do that. And he shows up at their apart their apartment in New York City. And it's just there. And I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that that's the scene when he like quite literally tells Percy you're my favorite child. Um, so he definitely like has a higher esteem for Sally and then by extension, Percy than he does for the other kids that he has um so that that kind of but it is more blatant in the show and it is something that they can do to try to make him a little bit better to make because that's one of those things that that a lot of fans would like argue about with Poseidon like does he care about Sally or not um does he is like, cause some people like the idea of them or like romantic, like it's fun to think about them when they were first together and everything. Um, and then sometimes you're like, he probably was, it doesn't because that's just how the gods are. Um, yeah. But there is at least something that he literally tells Percy, you're my favorite kid. <laughs> yeah. So it would make sense that he would feel differently about Sally too. Um, so I'm sure that that pause was, because he didn't want to have to actually like, you know, talk about feelings yeah. <laughs> and it, and like talk, actually, like actually talk to his son. Um, like, thank you for saving his life and all that. And thank you for being a, a little bit nice to him for five minutes. Um, and thank you for helping him get out of hell. So he didn't get, or to the underworld. So he didn't get stuck down there. Um, but also doesn't want to actually have a relationship with him either because as soon as he tries he's like bye <laughs> uh, well and he can lean back on we were told not to help out any of our own kids all he wants but i mean he sent he sent a neriad her like P percy's way already you could help through proxy or something you know mm -hmm. i do one i think honestly the best thing that they had poseidon do in the in the show that doesn't happen in the books is the fact that he jumps in to save Percy from Zeus and like um and what is the word like surrenders the fact that that he surrenders to his very annoying brother um and like admits defeat so that he won't kill Percy um in the books they are able to stop the war happening um, before it ever actually starts. 
Yeah, they get and, their own time, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, Zeus is obviously still hates, he hates Percy with every fiber of his being, like, constantly the entire time he's alive. But, so he still hates him, and Percy still talks shit to him and stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's not, they're able to stop the war from ever even starting. In this one, there's more, like, pressure because the war has started, and they, and he has to go there to stop it from continuing further and so poseidon has to do something like that in order for it to actually stop we're in the books and never even started in the first place um i think one of my favorite percy just percy <laughs> scenes that i see myself in which happens a lot is when he's yelling at zeus or he's not even yelling at him he's just telling him what a fucking idiot he is <laughs> like well, you're so you dumb and he's like your your family is a giant mess like your literal son is the one is the reason why this started and telling him like you can't keep your family in line through fear like it doesn't work they don't like you and so if your dad comes to try to usurp your throat they're not going to help you because they're afraid of you like literally not a single part of that is a lie that is absolutely accurate and it makes me laugh watching it because it reminds me of all the times I said stuff like that to my dad <laughs> and would just go off on him and be like, what the fuck is your problem? And would know the kind of stuff to say to him to get him to shut up and finally leave me alone for like 10 minutes at a time. But, and my, my sister would also do stuff like that. Sometimes she was the one that would say more. <laughs> my sister was the one when my dad would be like, oh, me and my dad had a horrible relationship and I was really afraid of him. She would like literally pop up in the backseat of the car and yell like, so do you. We are like, we are afraid of you, idiot. Yeah. <laughs> and then he would start yelling some more, which is why I didn't say that stuff. She was the one that would say it as like the golden child. She could, she could say stuff like that and not die. <laughs> but, but I could not, but I would be the one that would like literally like rip him apart sometimes like that and when he would push me too far and then he would get mad at me for three days and then come back and be like i'm sorry will you will you talk to me i'm sorry and literally be like crying on the phone and i'd be like yeah whatever yeah that dynamic is one of the weirdest like familial dynamics in the world where your person whoever it is in, in percy you can it's his horrible uncle basically <laughs> um is so manipulative and abusive and angry and scary but you also know what a bitch they are <laughs> and so you can like make you can break them down and make them cry in like short amount of time before they like recover and go after you again <laughs> but you do get those moments and they're like the best moments ever i wish i remembered more of them because they were really fun to make to listen to him call me like begging me to talk to him and just hang up on him <laughs> and be like no <laughs> which is pretty much what percy does there's other parts obviously as the books go on where he does that there's al almost like a scene like that in every single book but that's the first one i remember reading the book for the first time i was like i love this kid yeah <laughs> like i i recognize i recognize this attitude <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you almost have a built-in mechanism for them being narcissistic parents because the reason that he's going to come crawling back to Percy and whatever mortals he happens to offend is because the gods need praise to live. They're like freaking Tinkerbell who needs applause, yeah. you know, like they need their burnt offerings and their libations. And if nobody's attending their altars, like they're fucked. So that yeah. they need that. <laughs> Yeah, and it's also a thing of like they need their their whole reason why they make their kids is because there are certain things that they like physically can't do because they're gods and they need their kids to do these things for them and so it's like no matter how angry they get at some of them especially one like percy that's super powerful um there's only so much that he can actually do like yeah zeus quite legitimately talks about fantasizing murdering percy every single time he sees him and but like he can't he can't actually do it unless the rest of the gods say that it's okay or like in, in <laughs> i'm laughing because i'm remembering how in the very last book 
um, Zeus is like, we are offering you immortality. And he's like, no. And Zeus is like, are you, what? Are, repeat that. <laughs> he's like shocked. He's like, are you kidding me? You're telling us, no, we're offering you to make you a god. And you told me no, because you want to be with your girlfriend. Like he doesn't say that, but still it's like, oh my God, he is so angry. Like he is like livid. <laughs> like, um, they like close Olympus a little bit after that. And it's like pretty much like said in like the next series of books when they eventually start figuring that stuff out that they think that the gods did that because they were so mad <laughs> at Percy for telling him for telling them no and then making them actually parent their children instead of them just like continuing on as normal. <laughs> um, but yeah, those moments like you can't he can't actually do the things that he wants to to him. There's like little barriers they have um, to stop them from just full on like doing what they want. Like if Zeus kills Percy, holy shit, like Poseidon would like literally destroy the entire world if he did something like that to Percy without without knowing about it first or something. Yeah. <sighs> And Zeus would know that because he's used Poseidon like that before. He's been like, hey, let's flood all the humans. So Poseidon could just, you know, do that. <laughs> then there's nobody to attend to Zeus's altars. That's kind of the stuff that I like about this book series is how they use like magical things that all, but are like direct examples of how those things happen in the real world. Um, like there are always, like there, there are certain things that really scary people like that you know that they can't they they know that there's only, there's is somewhere of a line of how far they can go against you without it like hurting them they don't actually care if what they're doing hurts you they just care that it will affect them yeah. and so like zeus knows he can't kill percy even if he wants to um because it would affect like everything about like his existence and he doesn't want to deal with it or even like Gabe like Gabe isn't gonna do something bad enough to Percy where his where Sally would notice that she that he's beating up her son so he's kind of limited in that kind of stuff of what he can do to Percy because of that um that's very much how it is in the real world when you have abusive people around you like they know exactly where that line is and yeah they like push it as much as physically possible but they know yeah like what to do, like that's those stories with my dad. Like he knew what to do. And I would like, like literally like, the way I imagine like my dad and me in my mind is that he was like a rabid dog on a leash. And I was like trying to like hold him back from everyone. And that's how it was with me and my dad since I was little. And so it that's what that d dynamic of like Zeus and Poseidon and Percy, just Percy and the gods, that's what it reminds me of is, is that, of like this balance of, I will talk shit to you to your face, but when you start to like go too far, I will like do what you say so that you don't hurt more people because I know how dangerous you are. Like I, I can remember when I was growing up um, thinking like when somebody was being mean to me at school, like everyone was <laughs> at school, that I wouldn't tell my parents about it because I didn't want my dad to find out because I was genuinely like worried that he would like show up at school and try to murder somebody. And so I just didn't tell them. I didn't tell them anything about what was going on like that at school because I didn't, it wasn't safe for him to know. And I, would, I can remember thinking like until he died like 10 years ago when I was 29, thinking like the balance of, should I tell my mom about this so that my dad finds out about this or should I just shut up? Because there's always that, like if he finds out, I, I'm not sure what he's gonna do, but it's gonna be something bad. <laughs> Um, so I just wouldn't tell them things because he was too dangerous. And it's the same kind of thing with Percy and the gods. Like he tells, he, they know enough, basically enough to get by. But other than that, he's not going to tell them anything that he doesn't have to. Yeah. I mean, we, to compare it to Harry Potter again, we have a few yeah. elements repeated in like what he does here because we have like, Harry doesn't completely trust adults which is a very normal trauma response for somebody like harry and percy we also see it because you know he's always been pinned as the bad kid 
he's always been um, told he's too much trouble. And some of that still sticks, even though now he knows like, okay, I didn't hallucinate that flying horse. Like <laughs> I actually didn't hallucinate Miss Dodds. They were real. Um, mm -hmm. But he still very much is in that like, I'm not gonna rock the boat too much because my very existence rocks the boat. Yeah, like I'm here and that automatically makes things worse and people are mad just because I exist. So there's only so much of that that I can do safely, but also my dad is is also a really dangerous person. So I can say more things than other kids can say. And so it's like this whole balance of, of like, him knowing he has a little bit of like privilege like that in this world. Like I can say these things to Zeus without them, him immediately killing me because my dad is Poseidon. If an, any other kid at camp said that kind of stuff to Zeus, he would have killed him as soon as they started talking and wouldn't have even gotten to the point where somebody could have stopped, like stepped in to stop him. Um, so it's like he he's always going back and forth between like what he can say to them to try to get, to try to get them to listen because he knows he's like one of the only kids they could actually listen to and without just like destroying their lives while also try not to make them so mad that they destroy his life more than they already do. Yeah. <laughs> the other one that's repeated for something to happen. Yeah, the one, the thing with the comparison I like about Harry Potter and Percy Jackson, there's many of them, but the one when it comes to the prophecy stuff that I like is that um, Percy doesn't find out about that until the fourth book. Um, it's pretty far into the series. It is a horrible kind of, it's obviously a horrible moment for him to find out that his soul is supposed to be reaped and it, like I showed you that thing where he literally says, I don't want my soul to be reaped. And I'm like, thanks, Percy. <laughs> like That's the exact like way to talk about something like that. But um, like it's it's still horrible because he does agree to doing the prophecy before he knows that part of the prophecy is that if you are the kid from this prophecy that you might die. Um, they don't know that that part is actually about Luke. But But like at that point, they think that it's him. And he agrees to doing it before he knows about that part of it, which feels gross. Um, but at the same time, it's way better than Harry Potter, where he like immediately the first person that meets him is like, oh my God, you're Harry Potter. You're the boy who lived. You're this, you're that, you're everything. You're going to save my life. And he's just standing there as an 11 year old kid. Like, I just want an owl. <laughs> like, he, he doesn't like it, immediately as soon as he gets there. Like everyone is being like, oh, you're going to save everybody. And it's like, how? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Who am I saving you from? I can't tell you his name. All right. <laughs> and like Dumbledore just doesn't tell him anything ever and keeps everything from him from the last moment and sets him up literally to die. Like at least in, in Percy Jackson, they actually care about the fact that Percy is supposed to die. Like they don't tell him about it until the fourth book because you don't want to tell a child that he's like prophesized to die like i i do think that it's a, a better thing to tell him because you need time to almost like get used to something like that like the idea of that you need it like at least in my head you need it like roaming around your head for a while to figure out how you feel about it instead of it just being like dropped on you and having no time because like when he does find out about it it's not very long it's only a couple months before his before he would turn 16 and so it's like holy shit like this is happening really soon uh i don't know how to deal with this so i'm just going to avoid it as much as humanly possible but at least but it's still worse that like at least Chiron cares about him a little bit. There's definitely parts where I'm like, Chiron, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like during like some of the other books, but um, like at least at the like the last scene at camp in this in the show is Chiron asked like literally wanting to give him a bodyguard yeah. when he wants to go home and see if Sally is is home yet because. I'm like, well, I'm glad the show version of Chiron is doing stuff like that, like being afraid for him and wanting to give him a bodyguard because he's afraid because they're taking Luke seriously, like from the begin, like from the jump and are like, I don't want you to die. 
Um, and he's like, I'll be fine. <laughs> I'm like, no, you won't be fine. But, uh, but still like, I'm glad that they, he's taking a more active role. At least the show version of Chiron is by thinking about stuff like that. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, one of the other Chiron depictions, which isn't actually a Chiron depiction that I like is Philoctetes in Hercules, mm -hmm. um, where he, um, He's very protective over Hercules in that version because he's like, I've lost all of these heroes to monsters, like, and that sucks. Chiron is essentially the same character. For some reason, they renamed a Greek soldier into, you know, like this weird satyr person that's supposed to be Chiron. Like, why did they do that? I don't understand. Just so it looks more like Danny DeVito. Anyways, um, like, I do love that characterization, though, that this trainer of heroes, like, really emotionally cares about them and is like well shit i keep losing them what do i do i don't want to lose this guy mm -hmm. um yeah and I, I like to think chiron can see that greatness in percy and be like maybe this is going to be the one who makes it yeah and it there is some stuff with chiron in sea of monsters that if it stays the same will be interesting for that sort of dynamic to be there um because in the book of Sea of Monsters, Chiron gets kicked out of his role as like the head of camp um, because uh, Kronos is his dad. And so they basically just use it as a way to kick him out and get somebody else in. I, I'm pretty sure that Ares is the one that like concocts that plan so that Clarice goes on the quest and stuff. Because Chiron would never let a kid go on a quest by themselves. What the hell? Um, but that's part of that whole that horrible fight that I mentioned where Luke is like literally laughing at Percy that is dying um, at the end of that book. Part of the reason why he's going for him so hard is because he 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 exposes Luke to like camp like he turns an Iris message on without Luke realizing and basically gets him to like villain monologue about how Chiron has nothing to do with anything of this, which gets him like reinstated at camp and Chiron and his like party pony people are the ones that save them before he has to watch Annabeth and Grover get eaten by a monster. Um, but like, that's why Chiron comes to save him because they, cause he's able to show them that and get him reinstated so he can go and help them. Um, so there is a little bit of that before their relationship gets not that great in Titan's Curse. <laughs> <laughs> Time's Curse definitely messes with that a lot, but at least in the second book, it's it's nicer in a way that feels infinitely nicer than anything that Dumbledore ever did in the history of his lifetime in Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the thing with Harry Potter that always just ruins it, I feel like, even if somehow J.K. Rowling hasn't ruined it for you. I feel like this just ruined it like when the last book came out and you then like thought about every other book, even outside of that was like, huh. So from the time that he dropped Harry as a baby off at, at the Dursleys, he knew that he was gonna die one day. Yeah. And he, he definitely knew that about him as soon as he showed up at school and didn't tell him that ever and hid everything from him and basically was nice to him through all those years till he could get to the point where he was old enough to kill himself. I was yeah. like, okay, this is so messed up. I don't even, I don't even know like another like fantasy, sci-fi fantasy book series like that, that I could even compare that to, especially when it's like literal children in that series. Like he's a little, he's a kid, he's 11 year old kid. Like. I can't imagine um, like Chiron or anyone else doing something like that in Percy Jackson without people being like outraged that they would hide, like people are outraged at the gods for the things that they do to their kids and how they mess with their lives and stuff. Um, I can't imagine that anyone doing something like that to him, like at least Percy doesn't genuinely doesn't know about the prophecy because the gods tell them that they're not allowed to tell him. <laughs> Like they ha they're like legitimately not allowed to, and so they don't. Um, and it, they know that if they do, they might get in really big trouble. So it's like 
there's at least a reason for why they're not telling him instead of it just being that Dumbledore is a fucking asshole, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's mythology when kids have these really weird prophecies, the usual mm-hmm. solution is like, let's leave them as a baby exposed on a mountain and <laughs> hope for the best, hope they get eaten or die or something, and they never do. Let's see if a bird will kill them or not. And if they, yeah. d- if they don't, then everything's good. <laughs> well, um, and that in my brain there's two approaches to a prophecy either you prepare the person the prophecy is about for it coming true and make sure it comes true in the way you want it to come true or you just do nothing and then it comes true in a really weird twisted way because prophecies are essentially like these word puzzles you know so Mm -hmm. um honestly like I think telling Percy and having him prepare like, hey, at some point you're gonna have to make this huge decision and um, like, let's let's get you on board and give you all the information you know and stuff to eventually make that decision the right way. Yeah, and at least in that world, like it's established by the point he hears most of the prophecy that, um, that the prophecies are kind of they make sense once they once they happen, but if you try to like predict how it will go, it usually doesn't go the way that you think, kind of thing. Um, and it does definitely happen like that with the prophecy, like the big one. Um, like he obviously doesn't die, thank God, and he's not the one whose soul gets reaped um, by a sword <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But but like it makes sense for you to think that, or even there's other little like the prophecies and stuff they have as they go through like the books. Like you don't think that the person that's betraying him in the first book is Luke until it is Luke. Um, And there's other things like that too. The, The worst one in, I think, I don't know. It's kind of a tie with, besides the big prophecy one in the Titan's curse. um, There's a line in that, in that prophecy about how someone's going to die in like the desert. Um, and then a 12 year old dies in the desert and it's horrible uh, cause it's a 12 year old <laughs> and it, and like Percy like spends the whole night looking for her body basically. And they finally just have to give up cause they can't find her. And of course he immediately thinks that it's his fault. And you're just like, that's horrible <laughs> that this is part of this prophecy. They didn't think that it would be like the youngest, basically the youngest person with them that would be the one to die, but it is. And besides that, I think one of the interesting ones is in the fourth book, in the Battle of the Labyrinth one. That's um, that's Annabeth's quest, and her. There's a line at the end of her prophecy that she, you know, there's always like an extra line that they like don't they don't tell people at first. Like Percy in the book never tells them about the line about someone's going to betray you. Um, her version of that in the fourth book is the last line says that somebody that you love will like die basically. Um, and (laughs) one of my favorite things about Annabeth in the fourth book is that after she's like kidnapped and tortured in the book before, she doesn't give a fuck about like the rules. She doesn't necessarily care that much about the rules anyway, but she especially doesn't care about like camp rules after that. She like breaks multiple ones in the fourth book and you and Percy's like, oh my God, what's going on <laughs> whenever she breaks those rules because he doesn't, he only breaks rules if he absolutely has to, but she just like doesn't care. Um, and one of the rules she breaks in that she brings Percy on the quest with her when he's not supposed to go. The quest says it's supposed to be three people and with him it's four people and she's like, I don't care. I'm bringing him anyway. And then he blows up a volcano and almost dies. Um, And so she, because of that line in the prophecy, she thinks, you know, that she killed him for two weeks by bringing him along. Um, It's those like little things that by the time you get to the fifth book and the end prophecy doesn't go, you expect it to not go the way that you think. I, I remember reading that book and I was like, I swear to fucking God, if this book series makes me read all these books just to have it end with Percy like dying I'm gonna be really upset I was like you can't do this to me and so I was like I refuse to even entertain that thought like I do remember when I read the last Harry Potter book that the first thing I did was I turned to the last page 
and saw the words like Harry, Hermione, and Ron, and I was like, okay, all of them are alive. I'm I'm good now because <laughs> that was always the big fear. Every single, for some reason, after the Goblet of Fire, we were all like so afraid that one of them was gonna die. Um, there was like a, always a rumor for the last three books that one of them was gonna die. <laughs> one of the trio would die, <laughs> especially Ron. Yeah. Um, a lot of stuff with Ron because he keeps fucking up and like doing th and like hurting Harry a lot um, because he just doesn't know how to handle his shit. So that's like a, it would have made more sense, honestly, for her to have done that, but she's not a good writer. So she didn't even think about that. Um, but either way, I remember reading the end. I didn't even read, like, I didn't even see that it was like an epilogue with horrible named children or anything. I just saw that it had their names. And so I knew that they at least survived. And so I could handle like getting through that, that book to the end and know that they were fine. I think that I did that with Percy Jackson too, and just saw him and Annabeth's name and like the last page and didn't read anything else and didn't have any other context besides that they were both alive at the end of the book. And I was like, okay, it'll be fine now. <laughs> um, what was I going to say about Grover? I was going to say about Grover that I loved that this season ended with him getting his searcher's license. Yeah. that he was successful his best friends didn't die on their quest they were able to stop the war from happening percy didn't die zeus didn't kill him um aries didn't kill him dear god like how many times did he almost die in like 10 minutes um but either way it was really i i love that last scene with the three of them where um it's just really sweet to see like annabeth trying again with her dad since that didn't happen yet in like the show like it did in the books um and just seeing annabeth trying again with her dad probably because of percy and percy hoping that his mom was there which she is and grover getting to go on his quest and set up the sea of monsters thing and all that kind of stuff it was a very like it was a great way to kind of end the season before the like very ominous freaky ass chrono stream yeah yeah they tied up all of the loose ends kind of in that scene and mm -hmm. i love the setup as he said i love that the searcher's license is a flower like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very so, cute yeah and how excited both of them are about that he got it and how excited he like <laughs> this show the way that they the there's huge fans of it that are also writers of it and you can tell um because the line that grover says about finding pan he says like he says something like he's always moving and so it's all going to be about timing and i was like you assholes because pan is in the labyrinth that is always moving and i'm like god damn <laughs> like it's just funny yeah. to see them put in hints like that that book people can laugh at but and everything else it just goes because it doesn't it doesn't really matter um but There's it's just fun whole conversation right next to the talia tree too so mm -hmm. yeah yeah and like and uh and annabeth to percy being like she doesn't have opinions she's a tree <laughs> um but i was gonna mention like the um the dream with chronos um, first off, I appreciate Percy telling Chiron that he's very, very stubborn. Um, cause I'm also like that. If somebody tells me to do something, I'm never going to do it ever because you told me to, I'm not going to do it. it that, it's just not going to happen. Like some person can show up in my dreams and tell me, kill everyone you love. And I'm never going to say yes, no matter how bad my parents are like, my version of that would be somebody showing up and being like kill your dad i've been like no you're a jerk <laughs> i don't want to i don't want to do that even if he is horrible i don't want to do that especially because you're telling me to go away <laughs> which is essentially percy um i that was very like dream was like disconcerting because of those three seconds where sally looks like mean you're like <laughs> <laughs> or you're like, I don't want to ever hear Sally talk like that ever again. I don't care that it was a dream. <laughs> like, never make her do that ever again, please. Um, but I think one of my favorite Percy, <laughs> one of my favorite Percy lines from this season is when he wakes up and she 
is asking like, oh, did you have a nightmare? What it was about? And he says, grandpa. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny the way he says it like that. She's like, oh, don't call him that. Don't call him grandpa. I was like, well, he is my grandpa. That's just, it's so funny how they, I love how in the show, like when they meet Aries, he's like, that's my uncle. Like, what kind of family is this? Like giving them the actual familial role. But it's just so funny the way that he says grandpa. And then, and then especially is such like a 12, like 13 year old kid for him to not want, for the dream goes into like the huge like discussion we had about Sally and like him feeling responsible for everything um in the last uh, like live stream because Kronos tells him like you being alive is like the key to my plan working like that is just like what does that mean um and I do remember that in Sea of Monsters he has that dream like during the school year and he keeps thinking about wanting to talk to Annabeth about it and ask her what that means because it's scary to hear a villain say that you have to stay alive or that they don't want to kill you because they want you to be part of their plan somehow like he already feels guilty about being alive <laughs> and now you're making it worse um but I I did that is like disconcerting anyway for him to have that in his head but I loved the last scene when he doesn't want to tell his mom that obviously and so he says instead like it's said to tell your mom that you love her and she's like chronos the lord of the dead said that <laughs> and it's just you get to see them being themselves without gabe because if you didn't watch the post credit scene you get to watch gabe turn himself into a statue which is almost better that him like like reading all their mail and answering their phone when and having like no boundaries whatsoever is the reason why he dies because <laughs> he just opens it up without thinking about it because he's a horrible person so that was fun um but i love the uh, the last voiceover um i love the beginning and the end voiceover but the end one always makes me feel emotional about kids that are going through abuse who read these books or watch this show because it's literally saying like, please stay alive. <laughs> like yeah. he's saying like, if you feel like you don't fit in anywhere and you wanna give up, don't give up because you might be, because we might need you one day and we and you might actually be a part of our world. And if you leave, then you can't help us and what we need your help with. And I was like, that's like, when you're reading the book, you're just like, yeah, it's about like the Greek world. But when you're like an adult thinking about like Rick Riordan and telling that to a bunch of kids, and I'm like, that's just so sweet yeah. that that's how he ends the first book. And I'm like, I love Rick Riordan so much. <laughs> Definitely a sweet way to end the books and end the series. Um, because, yeah, like, um, the whole Greek pantheon can be seen as, you know, like one instance of generational trauma. You have... Mm -hmm. Um, Kronos, who took over for Uranus by, like, castrating him. You have Zeus, who cut Kronos up into pieces. Like, this has been violence from, you know, like, multiple generations. And mm -hmm. um, although they kind of give Poseidon the illusion of wanting to be a cycle breaker in the series, he's not. He's, he's really very much not. He's very much on board with their bullshit. I've said it before. I will say it again. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Percy represents a cycle breaker in a way. And um, I think when you, you talk about abused kids, like that's the best thing we can hope for is at least to interrupt the cycle enough. Um, I've, I've read somewhere it takes like three generations to actually like end a cycle. And at least in my family, like my mom did move away from where her mom grew up or where she grew up. She um, didn't have us involved with her family as much as like they probably would have liked. And so she did some of her part there, but it wasn't complete yet, you know, and I, I took that on and went to gentle parenting, attachment parenting and tried to break the cycle that way. And I have a much sweeter, nicer kid who has a calm home life and mm -hmm hopefully it will be a well-adjusted adult, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that's the best we can do when we are kids that suffer from either emotional abuse, neglect, or actual physical abuse. 
is mm-hmm. that we can be that person that, you know, helps the next person be better. And then at, that j- will just keep continuing down our line. Yeah, that's like my entire life, mm-hmm. literally. Like, I have crises about that in my head all the time of like, is anything that I'm doing actually going to make a difference? Um, because I'm going to die and I don't have any kids. And so I don't have anybody to like do that with, like in the way that you do or other people do. Um, And so I'm like, these people are all like this. What if I die or whatever? And it just like keeps going. I want to believe that it won't. Um, But it's hard to really believe that when it's such like an embedded like pattern um for so long and especially when you're like surrounded by people that keep doing that or like doing things similar to that or enough that you're not sure that anyone else is like it's hard to believe that people even notice what you're doing or that anyone thinks about it as much as you do (laughs) and so a series like this where Percy is trying, but he doesn't even know what the hell he's doing, but he's still going to try because what else can I do? Like, I am not, I'm going to, I'm at least going to like fight until like the last second, which is pretty much what I do. Like people, whenever I tell people about aspects of my childhood for the first time, usually one of the first questions they ask me is how are you still alive? And I'm like, I don't know. And like, also like, how are you not like a serial killer? And I was like, I don't, I also don't know. (laughs) I just am not. I don't, I honestly don't know why. Um, But I think that's part of why is like, you have to get so like outrageously stubborn and angry and just like refuse to like let them win. Um, Like that's the only reason why I survived past 2019 is because I didn't want my dad and my mom to win. And so I, and I felt like if I died that they would have won and my life would have just been depressing, (laughs) which is why it's hard for me since then when things go wrong to feel like that was the right decision of like, can something just go right, please? So that it feels like it was a good decision to keep trying because every time I do and it doesn't work out, it's hard because it feels like it's a whole like, like trying to fix intergenerational trauma thing, but it feels like everything you do is like so much more important. Like, um, I hear people who like leave like religions talk about this a lot that when you leave like the religion that you grew up with like i don't know if this happened with you and your mom but it wouldn't surprise me if it did where like when life stuff happens where things start going wrong for you you feel like this pressure to like almost not tell them that something is wrong in your life because you feel like it's somehow like a uh, like pr- a thing, they'll think like, oh well, because you did this thing, that's why this is happening to you. Like, oh, if you were still like religious or whatever, your life is going badly because you chose to like not go to church anymore. Or for me, it's like, oh well, your life was a freaking disaster pile the last couple years because you've like tried to like actually work on this stuff, and it's hard to feel like every this like pressure of like I feel like this pressure for my life to be successful because i feel like if it's not that the like my sister and her kid and whoever else may not want to try like what i did because they'll be like well that didn't she was never happy so why would i do that (laughs) and it's so hard to like make decisions when you're afraid that like every decision you make will somehow reflect back on this huge like existential thing that you're trying to do um and that's honestly part of this whole thing too is like Percy's like, what the fuck? (laughs) Like everyone's looking at me all the time to make all these decisions and do the right thing. I can never show that I'm scared or upset or angry or any of that. Like he, a lot of why he holds all of that in, in the books is because he feels like he can't do that. And that if he did, that people would get scared because he's supposed to be the one with all of the answers. And that's so hard to like walk around like that, but he does a good job. He has at least his mom to help him somewhat like along the way until at least gives him like the confidence that he can perhaps like do his quest without dying (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah well i mean going back to like the main theme of Kleos too um i don't think we need to have kids to make something of our abuse stories i mean 
part we've talked about like why we do this podcast and it is to just shine a light mm-hmm. on some of these like emotional and physical abuse stuff um and chaos is about like the the root word is about speaking you know it's it's mm-hmm. speaking um uh, people speaking of your deeds long term and um I've always said, you know, like, because we both have trauma dumped on the internet before. Mm -hmm. And if it helps at least one person, you know, as much as it's hard to do that, sometimes it feels worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, So as as much as we can talk about these things and talk about trauma and talk about like, recovering from that, at least somebody can benefit from it, you know? Yeah, like the what is the word? The survive survival guilt what is there's a term for that yeah um people usually talk about it if you're like in a war like percy and annabeth have things like that about them being in literal wars in these books but the way that that translates to real life is like i have like like i feel a lot of like pressure partly because i did survive like there's so many stories out there of people who went through the kids who went through the same sort of stuff that I did that did not survive. And I honestly don't know why I did. Like, I have absolutely no idea why my dad didn't kill me. He could have killed me a million times. I expected him to do it for like 10 solid years of my life, at least. I expected him every, like, I can remember in fourth grade going home every day from school wondering if today was the day that he was gonna kill me. And it went on for like years like that every time he lived with us that was the thing that I would think of like I don't like how are you supposed to plan for like um like college if you don't know if you're going to be dead like I was like I don't even know what I'm doing like I just picked a random college like for the places I tried out for because I didn't even know what was going to happen to me by then and because I did survive for some reason (laughs) like long enough to get past 18 and be able to like move out I feel like this outrageous amount of pressure to do something with it because otherwise it's like, why do I hear stories from other kids that went through the exact same thing as me, sometimes in the exact same time as me, if you go with like Sarah Turney's sister, Alyssa, it's the exact same situation. Um, Her sister, uh, Sarah was a little bit younger than my sister, but it was the same, same exact setup, like family wise. Um, everyone knew that her dad was bad. Everyone, like she told a bunch of people what he was doing and they just, he was a former police officer and knew how to work the system. He literally called CPS and told, and like warned them beforehand that she might call and like report him (laughs) and like said that she was just like a troubled drug addict child. Um, and like, you know, last week I said that my dad used to try to convince me and my sister that my mom was a drug addict. (laughs) So that's obviously something they do. Um, And so, but it's so hard to like have that survive, like know that you survived a situation that other people haven't, whether they literally haven't survived or like mentally they haven't survived where they're still so stuck in those patterns that they haven't made it out yet, that you feel like this outrageous pressure to do something with this information because it's like, why else am I here? Like, what is the point of me being here and knowing all of these things about how all of these things work if I don't use that to try to help kids now that are going through the exact same thing? Um, Like you can argue, and I don't think that this is a far like reach to say that this book series is pretty much Rick Riordan doing the exact same thing of him being like, this is his way of trying to give back for whatever happened to him when he was a kid for why he knows exactly how to write all these different kind of abusive parents and the shit that they pulled on their kids and how kids react to feeling that way it can't all just be from knowing kids at school because abuse kids don't talk to teachers a lot at school for obvious reasons i didn't i like i liked my teachers but i couldn't actually tell them anything about what was going on um so like that's essentially what this book series is So it's like, what else can you do, but try to share it in some way that isn't just full on trauma dumping, because that's not helpful, (laughs) but also helps them enough where they can get help. Because I, I, that's always the thing I get stuck on is like, what is the point of me being here if I know what those kids are going through and I just sit here and don't do anything 
to try to help them in my own way. Like I'm never going to do it then like the normal way, I guess, like be a therapist or work at a shelter or that's just not how my brain works. <laughs> I, I just like couldn't do it that way. Um, and I don't think Rick Riordan could necessarily do it that way either. I think that's why he wrote th like these books like this instead. I mean, there's some abuses that we go through that will slip under the radar that will like either because our parents are manipulative enough, like you said, or because it doesn't count as abuse to most people. Yeah. Like they don't see it as abusive enough. Like that's kind of my example. And so, yeah, like meeting these kids where they're at by the fiction that they would enjoy and just like kind of putting these little hints of you deserve better. Like these parents are assholes. So hopefully you can see how they are like your parents. Um, I, that definitely makes sense for him. And I think it makes sense for you as well of like, okay, well, if someone would have flat out told me this, I would have shut down. So mm -hmm. um, I, if someone would have put it in a book, I would have recognized like, oh, this character reminds me of my dad. Why does that make me feel icky? Yeah. Even when I read these books, I was 25 when I read The Lightning Thief for the first time. And it was so validating reading a book series. Even at that time, back in like 2010, my dad was still alive. I hadn't done any therapy at all. I wouldn't do any for another eight years. And it was so validating reading a book series where characters reminded me of him and those characters look like fucking fools. Like the characters that remind me the most of him is Zeus, who everyone hates. Literally everyone in Percy Jackson hates Zeus. The only person that doesn't hate Zeus is Zeus. Like, and he is absolutely the worst. Like, like that that line that Percy says of like, you're the biggest god in the world, and the way that you saved your daughter when she was dying was to turn her into a tree like what that's the only thing you can think of there's another zeus kid that dies later on and zeus isn't even sad like he doesn't even respond i haven't even read that yet i'm already angry about it because he's so horrible and the other person like him is like aries and also chronos but yeah especially aries aries is a freaking idiot in the series he's still dangerous he's still scary he's still abusive and you still have to be careful around him about what you say because you don't know what he's going to do but he also is the one that percy absolutely despises the absolute most out of everybody and for like your side of like the emotional abuse hera mm -hmm. like annabeth fucking hates Hera. I can't even put into words how much she hates Hera. Like, Hera does things to them, particularly be just because Annabeth tells her to her face how much she hates her. <laughs> and like, uh, like in the fourth book, I think there's a scene where they, her and Percy, literally tell Hera to her face that you aren't, that you don't care about all like families because she tries to say that she's like the god of like she wants happy families or whatever to try to get them to like get along with people better and they literally tell her to your to her face you don't care about all families you only care about what they look like you only care that we look like a happy family you don't care if we actually are happy and she like gets so so mad at them which is why people think that they she like took percy later on in like deleted all of his memories like that when she didn't have to she didn't have to do that to him but like she she is the one that annabeth hates the most she calls her like cow bitch she doesn't say bitch but she calls her like the cow god and literally calls her cow god to her face <laughs> and like hates her so much and hera is like the personification of like the mom who wants everything to look perfect on the surface because of image but is all but is like the worst person when you actually get to know them but she doesn't want the public to know that because she wants everyone to like her but she's a horrible manipulative like emotionally abusing monster and like how much more direct can you get than something like that like they don't it's right in your face like how you're supposed to feel about these people and why <laughs> 
Well, and what I relate to with Annabeth specifically is this expectation of perfectionism from one parent while complete neglect from the other and hoping that the perfectionism this one parent is like really propping up is going to impress the other parent. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as soon as my parents figured out that I was academically like smart, there was pressure of like, oh, doctor, lawyer, um, you know, like, what's the highest you could go with this and um you know pressure to go to college pressure to like get a advanced degree which i still haven't done um and so i i get that from annabeth a little bit too of you know like athena's expectation of perfectionism both fuels her and hinders her and athena is so horrible to Annabeth. She's that way where she never, there's never a point where Annabeth does enough to please her. Like even in the second series that you haven't read yet, um, Athena wants her to do like this really hard quest that no other Athena kid has ever done and lived. Um, and she does it and she does live through it, but obviously she doesn't die, but um, it's, in in like those those second series of books like she has dreams with her mom in there and her mom is yelling at her and like she's begging athena for help to find percy and athena's like i don't fucking she literally says like i don't care about percy i don't care about him i'm not helping you and she's like she's like percy is nothing and annabeth is like percy is everything to me and she's like i don't care mm -hmm. and she literally just tells her i don't care and it's just it's so harsh, but that's exactly how those sort of parents are, is there's no like level you can reach that will be enough for them to be satisfied with you. Like sometimes I imagine like the sliding doors version of like our lives where you ended up being a cardiologist and I ended up being like a paralegal. <laughs> like, oh my God, that life would have been horrible. It would have been so horrible. I can't even like right now isn't great at all either, but at least I don't hate every second of my life when I'm at work and I'm not and not having to deal with like shitty um, attorneys who yell at me all day and you don't have to deal with all that craziness of being a cardiologist like we could have done it if we had to, but it's so not who we are as people. Yeah. Like it feels like a farce to imagine living that life because that is not me or you like right now we go on the internet and we make artistic things and that makes us happier than everything else like 